Would you bow your heads a moment, please, and just close your eyes and pray a little bit as we look to Jesus. Thankful to be back home. Father, we pray tonight now that you will help us. I'm not a young man anymore, but I know there have been between three or 4,000 times that we prayed for you to help us when we went to the pulpit in my ministry. And we feel like, Lord, that you helped us and uh, believe you're going to help us tonight to encourage somebody. Because we're here to encourage people and we want everybody to be encouraged tonight. Don't want a soul to leave this building without being encouraged and we want them to get excited. Thank the Lord for Pastor Rodney that's so excited and the other brethren that was here today. They that told me, he said, well, Dad Ho, we're so excited about the service tonight. Well, I wasn't hardly that excited, but I hope it will get more exciting as time goes on because when the burden is heavy on a minister's heart, it's, a, it's another story. We thank thee for helping in the service thus far. In Jesus' name I pray. Now, wife and I went down to Parisburg last weekend, and we had a most enjoyable time. Uh, it was, and I tell you what, I landed right on the end of a 12-hour 12, 12 fasting and prayer by the church a few days before uh, Ron and Peggy went abroad, uh, went to Israel. And I believe that we, we got down there in time to really feel the power and, and the glory that was upon that congregation. And uh, the message that I preached, the brethren, uh, Brother Rodney said, would you share with some of that or share that with us tonight? And I felt, well, Lord, I'll be glad to do the best I can. And this was a message that I spoke to the people down there at Parisburg, and now they got happy. And now if you're not going to get happy, if you're bored already, I wish you would leave the auditorium, please. <laughs> Oh, I, I tell you, it will, uh, Lord help me now. I, I, I know he did. Wife would confirm that. And he's already helping here tonight. Yes. If I didn't do nothing, just read a scripture and holler, praise God, a few times, <laughs> uh, I feel like I could go home and go to bed and rest real good. Amen. And I trust the Lord. But listen, I want you to be stirred tonight. I really do because I feel like if we can get our hearts stirred and we can get encouraged that uh, when our pastor comes back here, he'll say, well, what on earth happened? Right. Brother Rodney, Brother David, what, what happened while I was gone? I remember a few years ago, uh, Brother Helm called uh, Terry and said, you're going to the Holy Land, maybe Kathy too. And then uh, sometime later, he called back and said, no, the Lord says he got a burden on it and, and you can't go. And how do you think Terry and Kathy felt? Well, naturally, they felt like they felt pretty bad about it. But now, Brother Ham said, now, Ter Brother Terry said, if you will rejoice and, uh, uh, you know, because uh, the Lord has directed, you'll be as happy as those who've gone to the Holy Land. Now, that's good to know, isn't it? And I want you folk, when they get back here from Israel, to kind of change the thing and make them think that you've been to Israel. Why, you just praise God. Every time they tell something wonderful, you glory in it. You holler, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And I believe that God will honor your rejoicing with them because, you know, uh, Ronald Jean, our son, says, well, if you, God don't bless you and he's blessing somebody else, said praise God about it. And I think that's a wonderful thing. Now, here's the text. It's a short one, but a good one. Do not live in fear, little flock. It has pleased your Father to give you the kingdom. What a message in this little verse. Do not fear, little flock, but uh, it has pleased the Father to give you the kingdom. Now, don't be embarrassed if I call you a little flock tonight because Jesus uh, spoke a little flock. I think it's, uh, it's all right. And uh, uh, just so your flock, whether you're a big flock or a little flock, that's another matter, of course. But, but I, I want you to know that God don't want you to fear. He wants us to have victory. And I'm here to preach to you and, and feed you and not bleed you. Praise God tonight. 
I tell you, I believe the time has come when we need to look up and proclaim our heritage in Christ and, 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 and have victory over self, sin, and Satan. And if we have victory over those three, we'll have victory. Oh, I, I know we'll have it because I feel it that, that we will have it. So uh, if we'll do our best for Christ and, and, and live not in fear, but live in victory, it'll, it'll just, well, it, it pleased the Father to give us the kingdom. Now, what is the kingdom? Righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. We'll, we'll refer to that in the, and what E. Stanley Jones said about that in the closing part of this message. Now, now think, now let's get down to a little serious time here on the fear of God. I don't want, I want this to be interesting. I want it to be instructive, and so I'll need your help. Uh, uh, I'll have to uh, watch my notes pretty closely here because it's important I stay with them. The idea of fear of God occurs repeatedly in the Bible, and here are a few examples. You shall fear your God, I am the Lord, Leviticus 19:14. The Lord your God shall fear, you shall fear, Deuteronomy 6, 13. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him completely and sincerely, Joshua 24, 14. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord, Proverbs 10, 27. The fear of the Lord prolongs life, Proverbs 10, 27. Fear sees them all and they begin to praise God, Luke uh, 7 16 and that scripture is found over here in the seventh chapter of Luke and he and he that was dead set up you remember how Jesus raised this dead man uh, uh, up in the coffin and began he began to speak well that had kind of frightened anybody don't you think even though it'd be a wonderful thing he began to speak and and he delivered him to his mother what a tremendous thing and there came great fear on all and they glorified God saying that a great prophet is risen among us and that God hath visited his people now that's a, that's a wonderful thing to know that a great prophet is among us we all believe we've got a great preacher here and there are other wonderful ministers here to work with him and we're excited about that now, in the book of Revelation, we're told many times to fall down on our faces and worship God in fear and trembling. Why, you know, uh, when uh, uh, Brother Tom England's uh, group come up here and they'd get on their knees and put their face on the floor, some of us might have thought, looked at that a little negatively, but uh, I don't think we should. I think we should praise God that they had courage enough to bow before the audience and before God and call upon the name of the Lord. And so the Apostle Paul writes that we're all in mortal danger unless the fear of God is constantly before us. These are just a few of literally hundreds of biblical references to fearing God. And there are many, many people who agonize needlessly about this because they completely misunderstand what it has said here. Now I want you to notice closely. The biblical writers are not talking about being afraid of God. Rather, the words they use and the context in which they use them make it clear that they are talking about reverence for God. Standing before God in the spirit of awe and wonder. Oh, we ought to do that at all times. Notice that God is the creator. God is the holy one. God is the mighty one. We are finite. We are dependent upon God. Well, do you believe that? Uh, uh, you're not independent of God. You're dependent upon God, I'm sure. There is much more to God than is hidden to us than the little he has chosen to reveal. There is an unknown about God. And we approach him in that sense, but not as a source of terror. Uh, he, uh, he speaks to us in Isaiah 56, 69, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Now, isn't that great? As our pastor would say, <laughs> uh, you'll let me uh, choose a, a statement to that he makes here once in a while, I'm sure. 
For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are, are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. What a mighty God we serve. Yes. Why, we ought to fear him. We ought to reverence him, not with that slavish fear that sometimes we might think about, but, but to fear and to love him. All right. Yes, as you ponder over, over these words of the Lord, you realize there is certainly an unknown about him, but there is such love and mercy. Oh, how we ought to reverence him. Hold him in awe and in wonder. Now I want to refer to what happened uh, here on uh, let's see, his last uh, Wednesday night, a week ago tonight, when we received the news of Jay Watson's uh, uh, death. Well, the Lord helped us in the service. You know how well it was uh, handled, how our pastor has, did a masterful job in bringing this and that and had a uh, rather a great uh, a memorial service. But I, I, I noticed something in this service. I felt such awe and such wonder and such a reverence for God. In, in all the years I've been here, I've never felt such love and such understanding as I felt last Wednesday night, all during the service and even after the service. I couldn't go home. Ordinarily, I want to go home and get my pajamas on and go to bed. But last Wednesday night, I wanted to stay here and finally came up here and I always said to him, Dad, what do you think? I said, well, I thought it was one of the best services we've had in a long while. Now, if you, I hope you understand that. You see, Jay wanted to go home to be with Jesus. He loved God. He reverenced God. He was, he was not at home in this world. If you knew anything about him at all, you know that I'm telling you the truth. Well, we're thankful for his life. He's not with us, but he's with him. One of these days we can go to be with him. I want to suggest that most of us here tonight will fall into one of two categories as we go to, as we try to discuss them. I'm not about to put you into one of these categories. You do that yourself. But the category you find yourself in will indicate how you are hearing what the Bible writers are saying in the many, many passages on fear of the Lord. There are some here tonight, a, min a minority, I, I should think, uh, who are fearing God in the sense of being afraid to death of him. Now notice closely, this is some of the thoughts I want you to be sure and to remember. And it is uh, understandable in many cases, but it is wrong, nevertheless, to fear God in this manner. For many, being afraid of God was part of their religious upbringing. I could testify to that myself, and, and I had good parents, but somehow or another it was injected into my heart that uh, God was, a, a, well, a monster and if I did wrong, he would certainly bring his wrath down upon me. I didn't know about the love of God as I've been taught in the last few years. And I think sometimes maybe parents have used God as a threat to their children, building him up as a tyrant judge or just waiting to punish all little boys and girls who got themselves into trouble. So this emphasis on the wrath of God can be terribly destructive to the human spirit. I, I believe that. I believe you ought to teach your children that God loves them. Yes. Teach them not to do wrong, but please teach them that God loves them. Yes. So we were designed by God to discover fulfillment in his love and mercy. Yes. I'll take my water now and my sandwich later. <laughs> <laughs> I thought if this service too long, I should have brought my sandwich and uh, had a sandwich and finished it. I never did like a dry sermon. <laughs> well, the Lord's helping us now so far. If you'll stay with me while we'll, we'll get through it, the Lord is helping. Now I want you to listen closely. <clears throat> Some of you may have read the book entitled The Plague written by Albert Camus. 
It is a powerful story of a town in North Africa which is stricken with a terrible plague. The people can do nothing except wall up the town, close the gate, and live in complete isolation in order to keep the plague from spreading. It is a masterful study of how people face crises and death when they are in isolation. One of the leading figures in a, is a Roman Catholic priest who declares that he knows very well why the plague has come to this town. He has been warning the townspeople for a long time that God is an avenging God and he knows that the plague has come as God's punishment. So he says, there is one scene that might cause you to lose some sleep if you really immerse yourself in it. It occurs on the first Sunday morning after the people realize fully that the plague has come and they are isolated and cut off. The church is packed with people and the priest rises to preach the sermon. He is a large man. With a stern face, he grabs hold of the side of the pulpit, leans over it, and begins to say, Calamity has come upon you, my brethren, and my brethren, you deserve it. This is just the beginning. As the fire and the brimstone sermon continues, the excited priest pictures God as having a great whip in his hand. So caught up in is the preacher in what he is saying that he actually picks up a real whip and cracks it over the congregation again and again. He literally whips the congregation for its sins. It's a, such a vivid scene you can almost feel and see the blood and the broken flesh. Shortly thereafter, an, an unexpected thing occurs. The priest loses his fire and brimstone theology. In fact, the very next week, he stands at the bedside of a 10-year-old boy and through the night watches him in unbelievable agony. And he cannot believe that a 10-year-old boy could have been evil enough to deserve this punishment. The experience thrown his faith into deep crises. That isn't the end of the story, but we'll have to leave it there. The point I want you, uh, I want to make to you tonight is that the sermon he preached is a good example of the way in which so many people think of God as a tyrant. Even when they have become intellectually free, they drag their part of the upbringing with them. And oftentimes it's difficult to get rid of that. There are people who are living night and day under the whip of this false god. It is destroying them. We know this is the work of Satan who does everything he can to destroy your love and faith in God. If you fit into this category in any way whatsoever, then you need to hear this word from Jesus today. Fear not, little flock. It has pleased the Father to give to you the kingdom. Now you can shout now if you want to. Just go right ahead. I feel like it myself. Oh, isn't it wonderful to be in the kingdom and have the kingdom in us. You're kingdom people. Remember that. Get the victory if you don't have it and keep it and God will continue to bless you. Well, you need to hear the gospel. You need to know the good news. God is a gracious God. God is for us. And if he be for us, who can be against us? He wills wholeness of life for each of us. You need to come out from under that whip and hear the good news and rejoice in it and begin to live. Now, I'm speaking to myself. As I said, I've been, I've been bothered with that thinking or that uh, influence, and I don't think is my parents primarily, maybe it is somebody I was acquainted with back there as a boy, or some Sunday school teacher helped me to feel that way. I don't know. But anyway, I'm, I thank the Lord that I believe I'm, uh, I'm getting better. I, I'm getting more excited and less fearful of God, and yet I fear God. Oh, I always want to have that reverence for God and love God. And you know, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. 
Dear ones, if we love you, you hear somebody say, well, I love Jesus. Listen, if you don't keep his commandments, you don't love Jesus. He said, if you love me, you'll keep my words. And I want to tell you that takes in more than we can think tonight. Take a long time to tell you what it does take in. Those of you that are under the whip, that is your invitation to life, to freedom, to release, to come out from under your, your dread and your fear and hear what Jesus is saying about, uh, well, you know, the woman that was caught in adultery, wasn't it wonderful how he treated her? They said, Jesus, she should be killed according to the Mosaic law. And you remember the story how that he wrote something on the ground and finally they dropped their stones and left the scene and then he looked up and said, Woman, where are thine accusers? And she said, I have none, Lord. He said, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Now remember the law said to put her to death, but Jesus didn't abide the law. He had something better than the law. The law of liberation, the law of freedom, the law of forgiveness. Jesus brought and I tell you that lady was happy and I get happy thinking about how that she was she was forgiven oh God forgive us when we want to kill everybody or, or, or condemn everybody we ought to be we ought to have such love in our hearts that uh, well when people get around they'll just feel released oh they'll just feel good uh, because for what we have in our hearts so uh, having said that most of us and the rest of us fit into the other category. Most of us have too little fear of God in the biblical sense. I believe that. And as a sign of our arrogance and our having come of age, we speak of God as the man upstairs. There is a tendency on our part to cut God down to our size, to carve him into our image, to make him fit into our schemes and our categories. And you just think how hum, humanist, human can we be? Uh, and we reach the height of this defiance of God when we join the crowd who proudly proclaim his death. Those who would mock and laugh and say they're happy that uh, Jesus was crucified. I don't think there's anybody here not feel that way. No. There is a real need in all churches who... Uh, from time to time to fall on their faces in fear and trembling before God, not as an act of abject terror, but as an act of acknowledgement that God is God. You see, if we can ever get the idea that we're not God and God's God, and we'll let him be God, we'll get somewhere in life. I believe that, or I wouldn't have said it. Praise the Lord. Well... May the Lord continue to be with us through the few. I just have a few more minutes here, a few things to say, but I want your heart to be blessed from here on out. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, we, we need to be reminded that God does make serious demands on us. And this fellowship here at Scott Depot, we're under that obligation of those serious demands. We need reminding that there is no cheap grace, no grace without cost, no grace without a surrender to our God. Oh, I want to, after I heard about Jay uh, passing an officer, said, who's going to take his place? You know what I thought? I'm not a young man, but I said, oh, I'd like to take his place and have his spirit. Oh, yes, just to have his spirit. He was a, he was a great person. I, and we all loved him, and we miss him. But I want to tell you, we can take his place by being cooperative, by church attendance, by prayer. And I guess he helped more people than we could, we could mention here tonight. He's, he had the gift of helps. So that's, that's what he had. And I don't know how, much, how many more gifts that he had. So may God help us. I realize that it goes against the grain of our whole uh, modern um, mood of independence our whole society is built around the feeling that we human beings are in control or soon will be we are conquering outer space we are conquering disease after disease and it's just a matter of time until we'll have them all under control who needs God anyway well I don't feel that way about it I feel that oh I know I need God so desperately we say with the poet, this is what 
some would say. I am the captain of my fate. I am the master of my soul. In a world in which mankind has declared its independence from God, it becomes humiliating to pray, give us this day our daily bread. This is a very serious matter. To declare independence from God is a prescription for inevitable disaster because it cuts us all from the very source of life. God is too awesome, too wondrous, too mysterious, too big for us finite creatures to comprehend. We, 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 don't, we know so little about him, and I know you would acknowledge that too, that we, know so, we want to know more about him. And when we have God's servants to come in and tell us more, we ought to get so excited about him that we just want to tell everybody that God is good. God is merciful. Well, praise the Lord for his goodness and his mercy. If we just had a little glimpse of him, oh, just a little small glimpse of him, and uh, we'd get, I'm sure, more excited in our hearts than we've ever been. Just a little, little, little more uh, knowledge, uh, maybe one scripture, one prayer. I was thinking the other day, I thought I heard a preacher say, I, I told the men here at church about it. It said that uh, if, we, if you feed your faith, you'll starve your doubts. Now think about that. Oh, oh then now you can get excited about that. See, if you feed your faith, not your face, uh, your faith, you'll starve your doubts. And we don't want doubts. We want to in increase our faith. Well... Just a part of that glimpse comes to us in these words of Jesus when he said, Do not live in fear, little flock. Don't live in fear, but live in joy. Live in peace, righteousness. Don't be afraid of God. It has pleased the Father to give to you the kingdom. The Apostle Paul tells us what the kingdom of God is in Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. What a sermon in that scripture. Think about it. And a word of admonition in closing tonight. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, to all the ways you can, to all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. Now that's a good message right there in those last few words. Uh, praise the Lord. Young people, you do that too, will you? Brother Hogue telling you to do that because I, I believe that God would have it. Now, you've got the kingdom, go with it. As, uh, as Joe told Hillary, said, to, Honey, right as she left this world, when you see the gates open, run and go in. I'm saying to you tonight, you've got the kingdom, you've got Jesus in your heart. Go, go, and tell others about it because it's a wonderful thing to be excited about. Let us stand and sing, Tis a kingdom of peace.